I remember there was a time, I remember pretty well that I was having a difficult sleeping. Most of the time I don't have a problem sleeping. Normally I can fall asleep pretty easily. But I remember just thrashing almost that the devil was just wearing me out. Uh, just reminding me of my past, reminding me of my guilt and my shame. And uh, it was almost like to the place and point that I said, I, this enough, enough. And I mean, I, I, I know, I mean, I'm being bombarded and it was, it was misery of having all this drudged up. And I remember it so well to the place and point I could not get any rest. It was, a, it was an oppression style feeling. And I remember coming to and saying, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if I'm in a dream. I don't know what this is. But I just have to say, in the name of Jesus Christ, Leave me alone. And I went to sleep. That is, there's power in the name of Jesus. That the devils tremble and are fearful of. I didn't say in the name of Jason, get out of here. They weren't afraid of me one little bit. But they were of the name of Jesus. I said that because I want to give you an introductory tonight because there's something we need to do to outwardly express Jesus Christ about who we say we possess inwardly. I heard an illustration of a New York City businessman who moved to the country and bought a piece of land. He went to the local feed and livestock store and he talked to the clerk about how he was going to take up chicken farming. Well, he then asked to buy a hundred chicks. That's a lot of chicks, commented the clerk. He said, I mean business, the man replied. A week later, the new farmer was back again. I need a, another hundred chicks. He said, boy, you are serious about this chicken farming thing, the man told him. He said, yep. The man replied, I've got a few problems I need to iron out, but I'm going to get it. The guy said, problems? He said, yeah, replied the man. I think I planted the last batch too close together. You see, we can't grow by burying ourselves and hiding our faith and expect sprouts to come forth. We can't say that we're saved and not have any actions and put our actions to use. We see here some actions that are going to take place in Acts 19, verses 11 through 20. And <clears throat> what we see here is just reflecting back. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, verse 12, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Wow, handkerchiefs and aprons. Tonight, I've just said, and if you're watching, I've, I told some of my friends I had to call this week, I said, look, I've got some verses of Scripture I'm struggling with. And I said, not only am I struggling with my Sunday, the Sunday morning sermon, I said, I'm preaching on the seven sons of Sceva on Sunday night. And I said, we're talking about handkerchiefs and book burnings and, and demon possession. I said, they're going to be having a special called business meeting on Wednesday and be looking for a new fella to come in after I get through with all this. It's not easy and I don't understand it all, but I believe it all. Amen? And I want you to see this because what's happening is, is Paul is in Ephesus and he's preaching. And yet somewhere in this, they were having handkerchiefs and aprons and having them blessed. Have you all ever seen anybody do this to say handkerchiefs and aprons? And if you'll if you would sow a seed offering right now, if you're watching, if you'd like to sow a seed offering to OMBC of $100 or more, we'll be glad to send you a handkerchief. And it's been blessed. That's why whenever you give them a handkerchief, what do you say when somebody sneezes? Oh, God bless you. Here, take my handkerchief. Uh, I just thought of that earlier when I was walking around. But I... I, I to have handkerchiefs blessed and have aprons blessed. And some of you may say, oh, I've received one of those. I had somebody give me a handkerchief. And that handkerchief, and I laid it on that wound every night, and I was healed. Or I've had that handkerchief, and I placed it upon their forehead, and they were better. 
um, or aprons and 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 some maybe they've had a small cross that they placed in their hand i've had a i had one man he had these little red bb uh, bbs a little red it, it was almost like a marble but it's a half a marble almost like it's just this and when i shook his hand he 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 put a red red dot in your hand and he said remember the blood of jesus and uh he said put that in your pocket you know and some of us we've had a little prayer stone we as often as i grab hold of this prayer stone i'm reminded to pray to jesus but let me just ask you it's not in do you think it's in the handkerchief do, do you think that it's in just the wooden cross part? Because I'm going to tell you, if we had the exact cross today, if we had just a sliver or a piece of the wood that come off the cross that Jesus hung upon, do you think that's what it is that's going to bring you healing? Do you think? I, I, I'm just saying that there's those that we put some faith in of the material aspect for the healing, and we forget that it is the God of those things. Now, I do think whenever I think of handkerchiefs and aprons, I do think that there are some things to say, hey, much like the quilting ministry. And when I think of the quilting ministry that we had here for, for a long time, there was something to the effect that they would make baby quilts or if we had someone who was sick, they would make these quilts and that was a quilting ministry and uh, maybe some of you all had even received a a blanket or a, a, a covering or something to just say hey the ladies of the church they they made this for you and um, it's to bring you comfort and but there's no healing power in those quilts that they made it wasn't in the apron. Now, some would say, but didn't they just strive to touch the hem of Jesus' garment? It wasn't the hem as, as much as it was him and the faith that they had. The lady said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, then I would be made whole. I'm a very literal reader, and I don't want us to put emphasis on something being more miraculous or not but note what it says here and God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul if you remember even those whenever Peter walked they want to be hanging out in the shadows and they just thought that if Peter's shadow would pass over them that they would be made whole there's a lot of emphasis and a lot of different things and and some want to capitalize on that and and if you watch some televangelists like I said several years ago we will send you right now if you'll send fifty dollars we'll send you a bookmark and you can a Bible bookmark and you can have this as a memorabilia token of a, this and th listen there's no special power in the bookmarker okay I, I know that we've seen those things and stuff but there are some that buy into this and they buy into it for the wrong reason, for fundings. See, look what happens here. They, they see this, and there are those that, uh, it says here clearly, though, and the disease departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Well, then certain vagabond Jews, exorcist, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure thee. By Jesus, note this, whom Paul preacheth. This is very, in, in, uh, this is intriguing whenever I see this and we read this because what we must understand is that they, they, uh, they use the term by which Paul preached, not by what we preach, not what we believe, but what Paul believed. And listen, Paul can believe it all you want, but you've got to believe it. And no, note what happens here. And there was one son of one Sceva. Uh, I'm sorry. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and a chief of the priest, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? When I read that, I thought to myself, wow, the devil knows exactly who the true believers are, who, had to, who he had to watch out for, and the devil still knows who the true believers are today. How do we know that? Well, I'm going to tell you how you can know who a true believer is. First of all, 
there's two traits that we've got to look for and the devil tries to pay attention to. The first, the devil cannot read your mind. That's why you have to speak to him verbally and audibly. Only God knows every thought and everything that is going on in your mind. The devil does not have that power. But the first is, in order to have the power over, over the devil, first, you've got to believe in the name of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. You've got to have the power of Jesus. You've got to have Jesus in you if you want to exercise the power of Jesus. You can't go about exercising the power of Jesus if you don't have Jesus. And then secondly, you've got to live in the name of Jesus. So it's not just enough to have him. Don't just hide it. You've got to share it and show it and tell it. Well, I hope you will take on the traits of life and ensure your name is known by the, by the devil. You see, I, I believe believing is an inside job. Believing happens by faith. Not by all the actions, but however, living is an outside action. I believe, therefore I act out. I could act out, but never believe. And we're going to see these folks, they're going to be acting out, but they don't have Jesus Christ in their life, and look what's going to happen to them. The question I have is, is that, you know, when they went against the devil, the devil says, Paul I know, and Jesus I know. But who are you? Man, I'm going to tell you, that in itself, that is, some, that is some powerful stuff. What are you, my question is tonight, what are you doing to ensure that your face is on the wall of Hill's Most Wanted? Are you on Hill's police wall? Are you on their post office wall? Are you on Hill's Most Wanted list? And I just wonder because he didn't even know who he was. No, the devil will know your name if you believe in the name of Jesus and you're living in the name of Jesus. He'll know exactly who you are. And you know what? You say, look, when I was in the world, I didn't have any troubles like I'm having today. Guess what? You didn't have to worry about it. You was already the devil's. And when you start doing something for God, you can bank on it. The devil will try to make your life a hell. And you say, well, I don't really want to have to do all this. I was... I was getting along just fine now that I'm trying to get in church. Now that I'm wanting to take on a position in the church. Now that I'm wanting to serve. I'm having all these things come against me. Yes. Yes, you are. And yes, you will. And somewhere along the line, we've just preached the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. That, oh, you won't have no more troubles here on earth. And, no, oh, everything's going to go okay. That's simply not true. Paul was out doing things, and yet look at the persecution he was encountering. But look at the miracles that was happening through Paul as well. When Paul went out in the power and in the name of Jesus. See, Paul didn't go out in the name of Paul. It wasn't Paul who was doing the healing. It wasn't Paul who was creating the miracle. It was the Jesus in Paul. Amen? It wasn't Paul. It was Jesus in Paul. He was just the tool to which God was operating through. And when he did, guess what? People could be healed of cancer. People could be cured. People could be fixed of their leprosy. People could be healed of a blood disease. People who had mental disorders could be touched. Blindness, crippled, deaf, mute, and lame. How? Paul simply believed in Jesus. And more than just knowing the facts Jesus, uh, about Jesus, but there's something about knowing Jesus as our Savior. James 2.19 says, Thou believest that, thou, uh, that there is one God, and thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Do you know the devil believes that Jesus exists? Sure they did. They could identify him. They recognized him. And yet they trembled. Paul had a life-changing faith in Jesus. And Jesus' name meant something to Paul as a believer. And I believe it should mean something to us. Here, the seven sons of Sceva, they tried doing a great and extraordinary miracle by the power of Jesus' name. But what happened when they did? What happened to the seven sons of Sceva? There was a demon-possessed man over here. And the demon is talking through this man to them. Demon possessions, another sermon for another time. But here this man is demon possessed. And the seven sons of Sceva, they're trying to make a profit. They're trying to make a gain. They want to learn how to do this. Although they'd heard about Jesus, they didn't actually possess Jesus. And G uh, they went out and saying something in Jesus' name, which meant uh, if Jesus' name meant something to these seven guys, then they could have done what Paul did. 
But how many people have you heard use Jesus' name somewhat like a Christian abracadabra? Abracadabra in Jesus' name, be healed, get up and walk. Now, did you say that they believed in Jesus? Now, only God knows if they believe in Jesus, but sometimes that doesn't always happen. Because sometimes God's answer is no. That doesn't mean that they were not a believer. And you say, well, I thought here in a moment you're going to say, we have not because we ask not, and if we're having anything touch and ask in Jesus' name, it shall be done. If we ask the Lord's will be done, Paul himself asked that he had a thorn in the flesh there. We don't know exactly what that was. We can guesstimate what it was, but we don't know exactly, and, Paul didn't, uh, and God didn't alleviate it. We see Jesus said to even the Lord himself, the Son of God said, Father, let this cup pass from me. Three times he asked that, and yet he still had to take on that cup of death. We realize that, uh, you know, sometimes God just simply says no. That does not mean that you're not a believer, but you're not going to be able to do the miraculous without being a believer. You know, I think Jesus is the sweetest name I know. You can't even say Jesus without smiling. Go ahead, try it. Just say it. Jesus. See, y'all smile away. I see, you're smiling. You can hide it with those masks, but I still see it, Steve, Tammy. Y'all smiling over there. Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Luke 9, John 13, John 14, 1 Corinthians 5. There is power, 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 wonder-working power in the name of Jesus. There's majesty in his name. Look at Jude 25. You know, his name is a name... Above all names, according to Psalms 138 and Ephesians 1. The point is, Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Folks, there's something powerful about the name of Jesus. And you talk about the greatest miracle that could ever take place is when a soul gets saved and accepts the Lord. That is a miracle, and we're still seeing miracles today. Well, I want you to note that the only name by which we are saved is not in the name of Buddha, get better, no. It's not in the name of Allah, no. It's not in the name of works. Oh, it's not in the membership of Oklahoma. Oh, it's not in religious claiming to be Baptist. It's only by having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to hear this. These folks were wanting to have an abracadabra potion. They wanted to have the, the power, but without the possession of Jesus. You know, a basketball in my hand's worth about 15 bucks. But a basketball in Michael Jordan's hands is worth about 70 million. A football in my hands is worth about $20. But a football in the hands of Kurt Warner is worth about 5.3 million. A baseball bat in my hands is worth about 50 bucks. But a baseball bat in the hands of Barry Bonds is worth about 90 million. A steering wheel in my hand is worth about $75. But a steering wheel in the hands of Jeff Gordon is worth about 49 million. A golf club in my hands is worth about 150 bucks and a slice. But a golf club in the hands of Tiger Woods is worth about $150 million. But catch this. A set of nails in my hand is worth about $0.30. Cents. But a set of nails in the hands of Jesus is priceless. Greatest miracle that we could ever have. What does the name of Jesus mean from the lips of a non-believer? It's weak. It doesn't mean that Jesus is weak, but they don't have him. They can say it, but unless they have him and possess him, they don't have the power of him. What does the name of Jesus from the lips of a believer mean? I'm going to tell you, if you have the name of Jesus Christ living and residing in you, and you have made him your Savior by faith and by faith alone, you know that it can make mountains move? It can take mountains down? Did you know that it can have seas will roar? Do you know if you've got the name of Jesus in your life, it can restore a marriage? Do you know that if you've got the name of Jesus, illnesses can be healed, comfort to the hurting, strength to the weak, rich 
riches are given to the poor. Fractured relationships can be mended. Churches can grow. People can be saved. Nations can be awakened. And folks, revival can happen. And I believe revival can happen. Why? Because we have Jesus Christ in our life, and we're asking for revival. So I want to just share this with you. So note, the devil knows those by the name of who they proclaim of Jesus. The second way the devil knows your name is are you living it? First of all, you've got to be a possessor of it, and to, a possessor of him. And then secondly, you've got to be carrying it out. Those demons may have not always known Paul. You know, there was a time in Paul's life when he was a killer. But yet we see um, he goes on to do some great things and change everything in Acts chapter 9, verses 3 through 5. And Paul was never the same again. He went from being the enemy of God to being God's friend and wanting to tell others about God. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loveth me and gave himself for me. Question. Who was Paul living for? Was Paul living for Paul? Or was Paul living for Jesus? And I believe we can all be guilty of this, but am I living for Jason or am I living for Jesus? Are you living for you or are you living for him? Is what you have his or is what he has yours? Think about it. Think about it. Well, here, the devil was aware and knew who Paul was and what happened to Paul. And Paul was a threat, a clear and present danger to hell expanding. So the seven sons of Sceva were living for the money, the power, and the prestige. Here they come. So they were no threat. The demons didn't even know who the seven sons of Sceva were. Didn't even have to worry about them. Those living for Jesus are no longer living for pleasure, power, or greed, money, or pride. Real living is living for Jesus. So in conclusion tonight, as I see our times come, the devil knew exactly who the true believers were by watching their actions. You see, the devil cannot read your mind, but he does see how you act. And if you'll note what these seven sons of Sceva said, whom Paul preached, not who we preach, you need to possess Jesus Christ in your life. You can't go against the devil on your own. You need Jesus. We are all a family, and we can all agree to pray together, but you must pray yourself. Let a man examine himself, and you must work out your own salvation. And you, the devil will come and try to isolate you and single you out. And when he does, you need to be ready, and you need to have the power of Jesus in you. The devil knew exactly who true believers were by seeing their actions, and the devil still knows who you are now. So I'm going to ask you, do you believe in the name of Jesus, and are you living in the name of Jesus? What are you doing to ensure your face is on the wall of hell's most wanted? Does the devil know your name? What are you doing that the devil in hell knows your name? There they go again, telling somebody about Jesus this week. There they are again, coming to grow, writing cards, witnessing. There they go again, going off, learning about him. There they go again, telling their children and their grandchildren and encouraging. There they go again, praying in public. There they go again. And they, I mean, the devil, does he know your name or are you living in the secret service and you're just burying your gift? Something to think about. Does the devil even know your name? But I'm going to tell you something even worse. Does Jesus know your name? You say, well, Jesus knows everything. Matthew 7, 21, 23 says this. There'll be many that have done mighty works and they've done good deeds, good moral things, good efforts and so forth. And they say that they've done it. And Lord, didn't we do all these things for you? And he will say on that day, depart from me for I never knew you. You can do all the works, but if you don't have Jesus Christ in your life, the works don't matter. And that correlates with what I was talking about this morning. I don't work to get salvation. I work because I have salvation. And if your work is a job 
and not a joy, then question your salvation. You're saying you're questioning it? No, I'm asking you to question it. Why do I do what I do? You all came back out tonight. You're watching online, and you didn't just swipe on by. You're still listening. Why are you doing this? Because I love Jesus, and Jesus loves me, and I want to tell the joys of Him, and we want to grow in a healthy relationship with Him. God loves to have that relationship, and when you have that relationship, other people see it. And yet we see here tonight, we've talked about handkerchiefs vaguely, aprons vaguely. Whatever happened, it happened, but it's by faith in Jesus Christ. And then there were people who turned away from that and had a great book burning. They had books that were paganistic, scrolls that were paganistic, sorceries and spells. In fact, it was quite an expense for them to turn away from that. Maybe some of you all have even had saying, hey, let's take some of your pagan books and let's have a book burning and let's have a big old, that'd be good to burn my brush pile out with. Just bring those old pagan books out and let's, let's set that fence row on fire. These folks, when they saw what happened, Within the seven sons of Sceva, listen, this demon jumped on them and beat them to a pulp, ripped the clothes off of them, embarrassed them spiritually, physically, emotionally, where they're getting out of there naked, trying to get out of there. They were trying to get a game, and now they're trying to get out of there with their lives. Put a whooping on them, so to speak. You ever had a whooping? Not a whipping, I mean a whooping. They had a whooping on them. Well, here... I want you to note that God's power is not in the handkerchief. God's power was not in those books. But what they were doing is they were showing an outward expression to say we are not turning to the ways of the devil. We don't want those things. We don't need those things. What we need is Jesus Christ. And so many times I hear people say all the time, what do we got to do to get people to come to church? What do we got to do? What do we got to do? We can't have an inflatable big enough. We can't have a water slide long enough. I can't have a smoke machine that, that, that will put out a mist enough. You know what we got to do to get people to come to church? Tell them about the only name, the name above all names, and his name is Jesus Christ. And express our belief outwardly. If we say we're possessors, let's be possessors, but let's also be professors. Amen? Would you all stand with me all over the church house this evening? Dear Heavenly Father, I love these folks, and I know sometimes I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. But Lord, we all need to be reminded, is that iron sharpens iron. Tell somebody about Jesus. Try it. Lord, we're not to hide it. We're to tell others the good news. And Lord, we know this, but yet sometimes we don't. Sometimes we're more worried about our name and what others may think of us. We may get embarrassed. Lord, we may lose everything we got. Lord, there's nothing that I have that is worth more than you. So, Lord, I pray that when we leave here that we would let our faith be seen and that we would indeed tell others about the good name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you. We love each other. And we love our community. In Jesus' name, amen.